Good evening. Good evening. It's good to see everyone here this evening. Just a couple announcements to get out of the way before we get started here. Uh, the discipleship class that is usually scheduled for Sunday nights, they're going to kind of play that by here. So with the weather moving in tomorrow, uh, I think there's nine or ten ladies that are in that class. So if you're participating in that, just kind of watch the weather. If it starts to look bad. Uh, Tam or April will notify you, and, and they'll kind of go from there, I think is what I talked to Tam a little while ago is what they decided. Uh, next weekend, we will not have a Saturday evening service, and that is because on Sunday morning, we'll have an, a deacon ordination service, and so those deacons will be here, uh, and we're going to ordain uh, Joe Cottle, uh, Tony Ritchie, and Paul Max the next Sunday morning, and so... Uh, Hopefully you can participate in that. We'll televise that as well on our uh, channel. Uh, and then the following weekend, uh, we've got, we have a guest speaker coming Saturday night. And so you guys get in on that before anybody else does. So the guest speaker's coming. I think he's going to be, be preaching on Jonah. And so we're going to enjoy that. And then uh, you can see some other stuff on there with the, with the food bank and uh, the, cycle, the youth and, and all that going on as well. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And then we'll begin our service tonight. Father, we do come thank you for this glorious day that you've given us, Father, this time we can come into your house and, Father, get into your word. Father, talk about going out into the world and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, Father. It's by your grace and your mercy that we have the salvation that we have. And so, Father, we are so thankful for your forgiveness. We ask that you give us guidance and wisdom. Father, we do lift up our church, we lift up our members, Father, especially those they're still struggling, Father, with uh, some sickness and stuff. And we especially thank our brother Terry. And Father, just ask for your healing hand to be upon him. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Good to be with you tonight. And thank you for your hearing from my voice as you hear or not back to normal. I think it's going to help you sing, but they are at least letting speak. So we're going to read scripture tonight. Two stories, two passages. One from the ministry of Jesus and one from the book of Revelation. Reading from Luke chapter 10. After these things, the Lord appointed 72 others of the disciples and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick in it, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. And then tipping your head to the end of that ministry, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And then in the book of Revelation chapter 12, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives, even unto death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and 
and the word of their testimony rejoice. All hail the power of Jesus.
Amen. We've got a great and awesome God, and He provides everything for us. And, uh, we're going to jump into a, a new part of this passage tonight in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, Paul changes his tone here, so if you've got your Bibles, I hope you open up to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read verses 10, 11, and 12 tonight and uh, talk about slaying dragons. We, we just sang some songs that talk about the conflict and the battle that we're in. And this is where uh, Paul brings it all here to us. And so once you get there, Ephesians chapter 6, we'll stand and give reverence to the reading of God's word. Uh, these three verses here, verses 10, 11, and 12. As Paul writes to the church, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we come before you now. We ask for your power, Father, to be upon us. As we know, we are in this battle, Father, with the God of this age. God of this world, Father, and he brings temptations before us and he causes us to compromise in our faith. Father, we just ask for your strength to uplift us, Father, for help us to be bold in our faith and, and Father, confront the evil that is before us. Please forgive us where we've fallen short, Father. Where we pray for our church, we pray for strength, pray for our nation, Father, and repentance that we would all turn to you. Lord, we ask for all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I heard an old, old story about a Savior that came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, his precious blood's atoning. So I repented of my sin because I knew that he won the victory. See, my victory's in Jesus, my Savior forever. He was the one that sought after me, and he was the one that bought me with his redeeming blood. And he loved me, even though I didn't know him. Because of that, all of my love is due to him, and he's the one that plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. This letter that our Savior Jesus Christ has written to us, beloved, has told us that he saved us by his amazing grace. And he calls us then to this purpose. We're chosen in him before the foundations of the earth were ever even laid. And it was by his love and his grace that he predestined us to be adopted according to his good will and pleasure to be his church. We are called to live out our faith in Him through His mighty power. And it all comes back to Him, beloved. It is all here for Him. And He provides the means for us to do His will. Isaiah 54, 17. He says, No weapon formed against you will prevail. It's because Jesus is overall. His sovereignty is throughout the ages. We're told in Matthew 16, 18 that upon the foundations of His mighty name, His church was built and the gates of hell will not stand against it. The gospel in word and in deed must go out and it does go out, beloved, as we the church take it out. The problem is, as we look at our world today, is that the church has kind of slunk back from our calling to fight the good fight. And after laying the foundation of our great God and Savior and all that we have as believers, Paul has given us some practical applications here in the Word. He has said, here are some things that you can do in your homes as husbands and as wives. Here are some things that you can do as parents and children. Here are some things that you can do as you go into your workplace. But now, beloved, now the language in this particular part of the passage takes on a more confrontational tone as Paul addresses the church to get ready for battle. What we have here is war language. And we don't often like war language because we don't like to fight. 
We don't like to rock the boat. We don't like to cause a stink or a stir. And when we do that kind of thing, we're told that you're not being nice. That we need to be a little bit more loving and a lot less judgmental. Listen to a gentleman called Bodhi Bakum, and Dr. Bakum calls this the 11th commandment. Thou shalt be nice in all situations. It's a relatively new idea, the 11th commandment. It's said to trump all other 10. But beloved, it has become a guiding principle in today's church. It has gotten so that if we question, it, if we question any number of issues in our world today, we're told that we're being intolerant. And the church has gotten to a point where if a believer tells another believer or even a non-believer that the way they are living is sinful, that's not nice. And for doing so, you're possibly not even a Christian at all because we serve a God that in some folks' eyes wants to save everybody. He loves everybody. He's not going to let anybody go to hell. And it's true that God does love everybody. I believe the enemy has convinced some people that this intolerance in itself is a sin. And if we tend to correct anyone in their sin, then we're not following what Jesus said in loving our neighbor. Now again, God does love all people. God wants everyone to be saved. His desire is to do that. But you have to repent and trust in Jesus Christ. And not everybody's going to do that. And so not everybody is going to go to heaven. And so there's a battle that we're engaged in. It, it's a war of ideologies. And all people need to hear the truth, not the tickling of their ears, lest they die in their sins. The kind of language that we're looking at today in Paul's letter is actually offensive. It's the kind of stuff that hurts people's feelings, although it's not the only passage that will do so in the Bible. You may remember Jesus calling the religious leaders a brood of vipers and whitewashed walls. He was not trying to be nice when he said those things. You see, he was engaged with false teachers. And don't get me wrong. Paul, Paul's told us to, to walk in love and, and to walk in grace. And we're to honor God's divine will in positions of authority. We try to love all mankind and, and we meet the needs of others who are less fortunate. Beloved, we try to live quietly, if, if at all possible, and, and do good deeds to bring glory to God. But you have to understand, there is an evil out there in this world. There is an enemy that wants you dead. There are people that follow this evil, and they will do what they can to stop you, and, and they don't follow the same principles that we do. And the gospel is not completely concerned with us being nice to everyone and not offending anyone because the message itself, beloved, of the gospel is offensive in itself. This is a battle cry that we have here. Jesus specifically told us that the world would be offended because it hates him and therefore it will hate you for it as well. The world crucified him. They nailed him to a tree on Calvary. And so when we speak the truth, it may bother some folks. So let me try to give you an example of how our love is to work here. If, if your house was on fire at 3 o'clock in the morning and I decided to let you sleep because I knew that you needed your rest, that may be very nice of me, but it would not be at all loving and it would not be the right thing to do. Because if I leave you there in the fire, you will surely die. And I believe, as much as I hope that all of you do, that, that your life supersedes your sleep. And if I woke you up from your sleep in the middle of the fire, that you would be grateful for the fact that I woke you and, and brought you outside. Yet in the same respect, if you do something that would cause if you're doing something that will cause you to lose your blessing or as a believer, or even perhaps lose your very soul in your unbelief, if I tell you that, even though it may hurt your feelings and cause you a little grief, my responsibility as a true believer is to tell you so. Jude even said in his word to snatch you away from the fire so that 
it would keep you from getting burnt. But the response that we get today is not the same when we present sin before others. You see, we are to point out errors from a biblical perspective and use the word of God to lead people to the truth. That doesn't mean that I'm to force you to trust in God, but I can forcefully point you to the place if I need be. And when we do that kind of thing, people often get mad at us. The word struggle in our passage is a term taken from Greco-Roman wrestling. It means to grapple. And, and, and you may feel like sometimes when you're speaking the truth to others that, that you are in this battle, you're grappling with them. We are to fight the good faith. This is apologetics. As we redeem what this word has told us, every square inch back to the glory of God. The dress that Paul will describe later on as we'll talk about some of these things in more detail later is that of a Roman soldier. It's a centurion. The helmet, the breastplate, the, the shield were all there to, to protect an individual as they drew their sword from the scabbard and attacked the enemy. And just in case, beloved, you think this may be the only place that we see this kind of language, I'm going to point out just a few more for us tonight. We'll look at a passage from Jude 3. Don't ask me what chapter. But Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, says, To those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Does that sound very familiar? It's kind of like what Paul says here in this book. We have the triune God that is over top of us. He says, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. My dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation that we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. His desire is to write about salvation but he cannot because he understands that there are false teachers coming into the church and they need to begin fighting some battles. Jews' word for contend is the Greek word apagonizomai. You got to say it like you're a Japanese samurai. <laughs> apagonizomai. It's kind of fun to say. And it means... To engage in combat. Beloved, you're contending for the faith. You're giving an answer for the hope that is in you, as Peter said in his letter. And notice that it, it's not at all odds with, with being called love and kept in mercy, peace, and love by a Trinitarian God. It, it all works out together. There is no contradiction in this gospel when it comes to fighting the good fight. In fact, it actually complements what is typically said throughout all the scriptures. And what Paul is getting at here is we're to engage in this battle and apologize. We're, we're to take the, the word here that we have out into the world and we're to push back on the evil. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. See some sarcasm in Paul's letter there? As he's talking, he's, he's meek and he's mild when, when he's there with them in person, but, but he is so strong when he's got his pen and he's a hundred thousand miles away. Kind of sounds like Facebook today, doesn't it? Everybody wants to write when, when there's nobody else around. He says... I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect towards some people who think that we live by standards of this world. You go, Wait a minute, Paul. You're, you're stepping onto some Corinthian toes right there. I mean, it's like he's talking to the kids in the backseat of the car as they're driving down the road. He said, don't make me come back there because it's not going to be pretty if I have to stop this car and get into that backseat. Y'all ever been there before? I mean, that's what it sounds like Paul is writing here. He says, for though we live in the world, we do not engage at war with the as the world does. For the weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments 
and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we'll be ready to punish every evil act of disobedience. Paul's saying, if I have to come there, and I, and, and I have to come, come face to face with you guys, we're going to deal with a lot of things that we don't want to deal with. He goes on, you're judging by appearances. If anyone has confidence that he has belonged to Christ, they should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as they do. So even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave me for building up, rather than tearing you down, if I do, I will not be ashamed. Some say his letters are weighty and forceful. But in person, he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that we are in our letters when we are absent, what we will be in our actions when we are present. Does that sound like a threat that's coming from Paul, beloved? Does that sound like Paul is being nice to those people who are coming against the true gospel? What he's saying here in, in all of these places, what Jude says, what Peter says, is that there is a war that is being waged against you right now. There is a battle going on even as we speak. In this moment, right here in time, we're refueling. You're in here, you're sitting comfortably in these pews or listening online or on the radio and you're, you're hearing the word of God preached and as you hear it, it goes into your mind and begins to renew your mind and your soul. And you're thinking about everything that I'm saying and you're processing all of this right now. And you may listen to something that I say and you say, wait a minute, Pastor, does, does that really say that in the passage? And, and you can take some notes down and, and it's okay to question what, what I say or what anybody else says and, and go into the Word and, and study it for yourself. Take down some notes and filter it all through the Word of God and develop a biblical worldview. You see, that's what we're doing. We're developing this biblical worldview. We're sharpening our weapons, as Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And so you're building up your arsenal right now, beloved. And the thing of it is, we're not at war with people. This does not say go out and fight against people. No, we're at war with ideas and philosophies of people that are in the world, that are at odds with the Word of God. There's a difference, right? I read this passage out of 2 Corinthians to say also, that tells us here to take every thought captive, to make it obedient to Christ. See, that's where the fight is at, beloved. We're not to take any of this personal. Remember that the idea that Paul has been teaching us is that Jesus is sovereign in all areas of life. He is the head. His lordship is to be pronounced in all of creation. He says here in Ephesians, be strong in the mighty power of the Lord. Our strength is in Jesus Christ. And we are to put on the full armor of God so that we go into this battle that we're in, this spiritual battle that exists in a spiritual dimension, but it affects our physical dimension. We're, we're walking in the flesh, but we're not waging war in the flesh. God is above and, and able to do anything above our expectations. And so we understand that in the spiritual realm, we are fighting this battle against a hierarchy of wickedness that is coming against us. It's coming against the biblical family. It's coming against biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. It's coming against your children. It's twisting and eroding the authority of the church. And all of these things, beloved, are happening in a physical world, but they're being directed by a spiritual realm. And so practically speaking, when we're looking at a worldly philosophy and the ideas that the world presents to us, we gauge them through the word of God. We take what we have here and we see how does that then measure up to the Bible? What does God say about adultery? What does God say about abortion? What does God say 
about sodomy, about the role of civil government. What's God say about the church? You see, God says a lot of things about these things in his word. And that's where we're to follow. But you see, the world says a lot about these things as well. And that's where the conflict is. That's where our apagonizomai takes place. So we take this biblical worldview that we're developing by studying the word of God and let it filter into us and, and we look at it through this lens that we have that God has given us and we say no you cannot murder babies in the womb because God says it's wrong he formed them he fashioned them he knew them as the psalmist said and if you don't like that you don't have a problem with me you've got a problem with God I'm just the messenger these ideas out there, we are called to take hold of. And either they match up with this word of God and they bring life, or they don't and they get tossed out. And the thing of it is, beloved, you have to know this word in order to engage the world with it. That's where the armor comes into play. Paul is saying, we have a mighty God. He is over all things and he is fighting for us. But he also calls us as his church to engage. And so a dialogue ensues in our spheres of influence as we respectively and graciously take the truth and present it to a world that for the most part is going to reject it. And that's where it's hard. It's not easy. It's not called contending for the faith for nothing. It's a battle. And sometimes you feel like you're losing. I have had Christians tell me that they did not believe that what I was standing for was right when it was clearly written here in God's word. And so we had to just dis disagree and we had to part ways because for me, there are some things that I'm just not going to compromise on. And that is not my ultimate wish that we have to part ways. But that's just how it is. Because when we contend for the faith, sometimes we're going to feel like we're standing alone. But we're not. Because we're standing, as Paul says, in the mighty power of God. Do you know who provides the armor? The king. The king provides all of his armor for his soldiers. This is all his. I, I'm his. And, and hopefully you're his. He's writing the story. We, we've already talked about that. And it's not much of a secret, but I'll go ahead and tell you anyway, I've read the end of the book. He wins. As does all who follow him. We don't have to fear anything. He forgave us when he saved us. He defeated death. He defeated sin. And now he asks you and me to be part of this. To suit up for our apagonizomai. Try to get that in there as many times as I can. Because you have to know him. And when you know him fully, you trust him. And you follow him wherever he leads. Love, that's our calling. To get into the battle. To follow the king who is leading the way. And again, it's not easy. It's a struggle. It's contention. It's conflict. And I know you don't like it. I don't like it. But that's just the nature of it. Jesus said it would be that way. But he's going to be with us the whole time. Amen.
Let's close the word of prayer. Fathers, we study your word. Sometimes we come to passages like this that we know cause us to struggle. Father, we don't like to fight. In fact, your word tells us that we're to live quiet lives if we possibly can, Father. But we know there's a world out there that comes against us. And so, Lord, we need your power, as you say, you give us here. We need your power to be bold in our faith and to, to take this word out lovingly and respectively but with as much grace, Father, as you can pour upon, upon it. And share the truth with the world around us. Father, I feel as though time is ticking away. And it's getting closer and closer to the end. The day when Jesus will come back. And what a glorious day that will be. But Father, we know right now that we have friends and loved ones that are, that are lost. They don't know you. So Lord, we ask in this moment. Maybe there's somebody going to be listening to this video. And maybe they're going to hear on the radio that. At some point in time. And, and Lord maybe they'll be here tomorrow. Maybe they're here right now. And Lord I just ask that you lay your hand upon them. Father you draw them closer to the cross. Draw them closer to Jesus Christ. That they may know you as the Lord. Father that we engage. In the battle that's taking place. We ask in Jesus name. Amen. Brother John Gatlin, will you uh, dismiss us in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Almighty God, we bow before you, Lord, to acknowledge who you are, to praise you, Lord, to thank you for the love and the mercy that you shower upon us each and every day, for taking us out of this world, Father. As Brother Jeremy said, we are in a fallen world, Father. But the good news is you have overcome this world. Father, I thank you for our brothers and sisters that are here this evening. I thank you for this church body. Father, I ask a special blessing on each, on each individual. Strengthen each of us, Father, as we face these things, as we face this fallen world every day. Thank you, Father, for Brother Paul. Thank you for healing him. He leads our music. Thank you, Father, for Brother Jeremy and his family. Keep them safe, Father. Keep them strengthened as they strive to do battle in this unholy war that we face. Father, I pray that you will be with each one of us here as we leave here. Keep us safe. 
guide us, Father, in everything that we do. And reinforce in our heart everything that Brother Jeremy laid out today. That those that we confront are those that we love. Those that we offer the saving grace of Jesus Christ, who is the only promise in this lost world. And Father, we'll give you the glory. All is accomplished. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.